Martin Croxell is a presenter on BBC News and BBC World News, known for her warmth and humour. She joined BBC News in 2001 and has covered every major news story ever since. Last year, it fell to Martin to announce the death of His Royal Highness the Prince Philip on all the BBC's English-speaking channels, and she was also on air when the terror attacks took place in London and Paris. And she's with us here just now. Good afternoon. How are you today? Hello, Toby. I'm very well, thank you. I better be warm and humorous then. <laughs> yeah, you I? better. So <laughs> what is a typical day like working at BBC News? Every day is different, which is what makes it such a great job to have. Yeah. Um, so on a normal day, you would have a plan of what the news stories you're going to cover. And I get into work a couple of hours before I'm due to go on air, often on air for about three hours at a time, which is quite a long time. You know, you yeah. feel you feel like you've done it by the end. <laughs> you've had to concentrate quite hard. So I go in and I talk to the assistant editor who uh, has decided which stories we're going to cover and how we're going to cover them. And the things I'm particularly interested in are finding out who are the interviewees that I'm going to be talking to so I can do some uh, research around the subject and, and their viewpoints and work out what questions I'm going to ask. We do get sent guest briefs by our very hardworking producers who give you a sort of steer as to what they think you might want to ask. But in the end, it's up to the presenter to decide. Yeah. And of course, you might decide in advance what you think you're going to ask. And then the, the interview might go a different way. And it's really important to listen so that you don't um, miss out on a, a really good follow up question that you might not have expected to ask. The other things that I want to know about are live events. So say there's a press conference from Downing Street. I will want to know when that's happening who's going to be speaking and why and then I will be, need to sort of um, know the context of the subject matter so I can talk around it yeah. so and then I go to makeup um, we're not allowed to be in makeup for very long at the moment because of COVID so you get your hair done or your makeup done and uh, you do the other uh, <laughs> while the makeup artist is uh, is doing half the job for you and then you put your kit on, which is this strange sort of um, elasticated black belt that sits under your clothes with two pockets in it to hold your talkback unit, which means that you can hear the gallery. That's all the, the noise in your ear to give you direction and your microphone. Yeah. So and then it means you can walk around the studio and you're not stuck to the desk all the time. So and then I go into the studio about 10 minutes before I go on air, put that kit on and off you go. Yeah. And is the preparation sometimes limited? Because I suppose a lot of the stories you are covering might only break whilst you're on air. Exactly. So what I've just described is when there's no breaking news yeah. and you've planned your output. So in the in the table, the desk that I sit at, which has a glass top, there's a computer facing up and in it are our running orders and each running order lasts for half an hour and it contains your headlines and, and your cues, which is the introductions that you're going to read, which appear on auto cue. But when there's a breaking story that happens, all of that pre-prepared information gets dropped yeah. and you are faced basically with an empty screen. And so, for example, in the case of the Paris attacks or the London Bridge terror attacks, which as you mentioned I was on air for, um, you get initial reports coming in. You report those. You try to get eyewitness accounts. You have to be really careful which social media accounts you follow because mm. a lot of it is wrong, yeah. fake. It's just people's opinion and um, their guesswork. And we don't want to be um, peddling that. So you're asking those basic journalistic questions of who, what, when, where why how and sometimes you're sort of really inching your way into a story because it's unfolding as you're talking so yeah that's that's when it gets very exciting yeah. um, because you're you're trying to work out what's really going on and is there more preparation that goes into the sort of big bulletins like the one o'clock news and the six o'clock news than on the news channel or is it still about the same it's really different you're comparing very different beasts mm -hmm. so the news channel um, I do the news channel because it's all a bit crash bang wallop yeah. and you don't quite know what you're going to get um there's a huge amount of preparation that goes into it but you are having to you know feed that machine hour upon hour upon hour whereas with the big set piece bulletins the, ne the network national bulletins um the one six and ten you do spend a lot of time really thinking hard about your writing your cues the question that you're going to ask the um correspondent but you don't have regular guests like you would you wouldn't interview scientists or politicians 
on those bulletins, you only interview correspondents and you agree the question with them in advance, um, which is not a practice I would normally advise for anything. Yeah. But, you, but you do that with correspondents so that you're getting the best possible question on air because you've often only got one question or two questions because they've only got a minute, minute 15 to to talk. So, yeah, we do sit there and, and think really hard about it because we've got the times. I present the one o'clock news quite often these days and also the network bulletins on a weekend on Saturday night. So you do have a bit more time to be more considered, mm. but there's still a rush right at the last minute. It's really funny. You sit there for hours and then there's this frantic rush to get everything on air at the last minute. It's just the way news is, you know, stuff comes in at the last minute because you want yeah. it to be the most recent pictures, the freshest top line, you know, the most recent news. So there's always a bit of a scramble at the last minute yeah. which makes it exciting yeah that's the thing i guess if i was like the director or whatever that would really stress me out knowing that not all the content is already prepared yeah i was on, went on air the other day and our top top story our top package report at one o'clock wasn't ready yeah so we were literally in the headlines and the title sequence we didn't know whether the top story was going to make hmm. and so we just had i just got a message in my ear of what i needed to do which would probably go straight to the correspondent in lviv in Ukraine and talk to her for longer than we would have done had we had the report. Yeah. As it turned out, it was edited just in the nick of time. Wow. But you, you just have to, you, it might sound a bit scary, but when you've when you've been doing it a long time, these things really don't worry you because mm. you're just so used to it. Yeah. So where did your love of journalism start? How did you actually get into this sort of work? It was a very lowly beginning, Toby, <laughs> I can tell you. So I'd done a geography degree at Leeds University and then I'd taken some time out to travel through Africa to see some of that geography and I had an idea that I thought I wanted to be a radio magazine producer mm. so not news but sort of chat I just thought it would be interesting to do something that was creative and that was about talking to different people about different things but I never ever intended to be on air I didn't want to be a radio presenter I didn't, certainly didn't want to be a television presenter yeah. I was quite shy when I was growing up and a lot of my contemporaries from school um, were a bit surprised that I ended up doing this this job I, mean, I was kind of quietly confident in my own way but um I was the kind I was the girl who blushed the color of a beetroot when I had to speak in class yeah. so my my sort of friends from school are like what you now do what um but you know I'm not 14 anymore and thankfully as my parents promised that tendency to blush terribly did leave me in the end um it was accidental so I went to I called my local radio station which is Radio Leicester because I'm from Leicestershire and I'd gone back to live with my uh, mum and dad after university like a lot of people do because you've got no money and I rang the local radio station I said I'd really like to come and see what you do and in those days you could do that so the station manager said yeah come in come in and see and I walked into the newsroom and I, I was kind of equally terrified and excited because it was busy people were running around you know trying to get stuff on air as quickly as they could for news bulletins and I was um, placed with the morning phone in program, and I literally started by making the tea. Wow. And answering the phones and doing bits of clerical work. And I just, I, I was like a sponge. I just really absorbed everything that was going on around me. And again, never ever wanted to be on air. And then one day, um, there was no one to go and do a, a live interview. I did my kind of did my broadcasting bit back to front because most people start doing pre-recorded stuff so yeah. that if you make a mistake, it, you know you can correct it. But oh no, I started doing all the live stuff. So it, we were launched. There was a launch of a charity campaign to raise money to plant a, a national forest in Northwest Leicestershire, and this was the launch of it. And I interv interviewed somebody from the charity and a man dressed as a tree. And there's a fantastic <laughs> fantastic photograph it was in the Leicester Mercury it was also on the front cover of the BBC's internal magazine which back then used to be printed every week it was called Ariel and it is still called Ariel but you only get it online these days and there's a photograph of me aged 22 looking very sort of young and fresh faced interviewing this man in a rubber tree suit and that's how it started mm. and I seemed to be able to speak fluently and describe what was going on because you're the eyes of the listener as everybody who works in radio knows and I did a good job of it. Mm. And then they said, we'd like to train you to use the radio car. So for the next six months, I spent four, five, six days a week going around Leicestershire and Rutland reporting live from various different places. Mm. And then there was a real push in the 1990s, which is when this was, for everyone to have journalistic training. So 
I they wanted me to be able to work in the newsroom at Radio Leicester because I was I was good at doing new live news reporting, but they wanted me to have the kind of um, theoretical and practical backup. So I went off to London for a month, uh, no, three weeks, sorry, and learnt my trade. And then I went off to Bristol to put those skills into practice in the Bristol newsroom. And then I went back to Radio Leicester as a reporter, and I did every job on the station really I would you know did news editing shifts news reading shifts I used to I was really good at creative packaging mm. which is where you turn a story into something interesting to listen to and then I started to present programs and never stopped I was in the end I was this has happened all throughout my career it's happening again to me now which is a really nice position to be in you know you, you get asked to do more and more and more and you become better at it and you're reliable and you're flexible and you, you know, you hopefully you're not too egotistical <laughs> and you, um, people like working with you and then you get a chance to do lots of new things. Yeah. So I was on air seven days a week and then I went to work in a, just a training attachment at East Midlands today in Nottingham to learn some television. And I was there for about four months and then I landed a job about two months later at BBC Elstree, which is where they make EastEnders. Yeah, Muppet Show. I was working for Newsroom South East, which was the precursor to what's now BBC London. And again, I was just fortunate, I suppose. I turned up as a, as a broadcast journalist. So you're a bit of a jack of all trades. You do a bit of everything. Yeah. And then one day I'd been there about, oh, I don't know, a week and a half. And I got a phone call one night to say, you're doing the breakfast bulletins tomorrow. And I said, yes, I know. I'm producing them. I'm put, outputting them. And they went, no, you're presenting them. Well, wow. Somebody, Somebody's gone sick. I was absolutely terrified. And I'd done loads of rate. I'd done loads of radio but actually you know being on air in front of a camera was totally different mm. and um but again I did it and I did it okay and I got better and better at it and then I ended up being on air seven days a week presenting yeah so it's I've, it's partly about being in the right place at the right time it's also wanting it and working hard and really putting the hours in I mean gosh I used to work some really long hours I mean I didn't have any children I wasn't married you know I had no responsibilities and I could just throw myself into work and it was the most fantastic grounding. It really was. And, um, and I'm still doing new things now, which is, is really exciting. I've been with the BBC 30 years wow. and I'm still getting to do new things. So, uh, yeah, it's 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 a partly about being in the right place at the right time and also saying yes to things that frighten you. Yeah. And if you went back in time and told yourself all those years ago that in the future you would be a core presenter on BBC News, how do you think you would have reacted? I would have said, don't be ridiculous. <laughs> I'd never have believed it. It wasn't how I saw myself. It just wasn't in my sights mm. I didn't even want to do it so I didn't so it wasn't a case of wanting to do it and not thinking you could it mm. wasn't even what I set out to do but I'm so glad I did it's almost as if the job chose me yeah that's an interesting idea mm. and of course you recently won Celebrity Mastermind as well I that must did. have been fun oh it was once it was over <laughs> yeah um, so I, I was asked if I'd like to do it and you know months in advance you go yeah 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 sure and they liked the subject that I chose which was Nelly Bly, who was the most famous journalist in North America in the late 1800s. And she was the pioneer of investigative journalism, known as stunt journalism back then. She had herself rather um, riskily uh, admitted to a mental hospital in New York, almost didn't get out again. Um, and she, when she got out, she reported about the conditions and the treatment of the patients and she changed the way mental health patients were treated. Mm. Um, and then she... Um, Sing, she went round the world in to following the fictional Phileas Fogg around the world in 80 days um, journey. And she did it for real on her own, which was very unusual for a woman to do in those days. And she did it in 72 days. And then she wrote about it. She was a foreign correspondent. She was a social justice campaigner. She was a feminist and she was an industrialist and an inventor. She was a really amazing woman. She'd probably have been quite annoying, actually, but <laughs> she she was fascinating. Anyway, so that was my chosen subject. And then just before I was going to Belfast to record it, I just thought, what am I doing? This is insane. I don't want to do this. I was so stupid to agree. Anyway, um, it's too late. So, you know, I turned up and I sat in that studio. It's a very beautiful studio. There's no audience anymore because of COVID. Mm. And um, it's a light, a, an illuminated floor. That black 
chair looks tiny. Wow. And they trickle that music in and it's so menacing. Oh. And it just makes you feel even worse. And I sat there and I couldn't stop my legs shaking. I was so nervous. And I'm used to being in a live TV studio. I yeah. love live TV. But that, oh, and I was even being asked questions by my colleague, Clive Murray, who I've worked with for years. But I was, it was really, really scary. But as it turned out, I'd done my homework. You know, I'm a bit head girl about these mm. things. And um, I got 10 out of 10, thankfully, on my specialist subject. And then I got 11 out of 15 on the... Mm. Um, g- general knowledge round. I think um, journalists and stand-up comedians tend to do quite well with the um, general knowledge yeah. because we're absorbing in information all the time. So yeah, I came home with a trophy. Yeah. I was very happy about that. Yeah, I was going to say being a news presenter must be an advantage because you have to be quite knowledgeable, I suppose. And actually you've witnessed a lot of the things that questions might be about. Yes, very much so. And also as a geographer, Mm. by my sort of academic background. I'm just interested in in a lot of things. I'm a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society. I host events for them. So I get to learn about and listen to lots of really interesting, clever, well-informed people. And you absorb some of it. I mean, not all of it. I'm not an expert on anything in particular, apart from um, possibly equal pay. Mm. Um, Mm. But yeah, your brain holds on to quite a lot of stuff. It's just a case of accessing it. Yes. Now, last year, of course... It was down to you to break the news of the death of His Royal Highness, the Prince Philip. What was going through your head in that moment? I don't want to be here. I want to run away from this studio, Mm. was what was really going on in my head, if I'm honest. Um, The hour before it, 11 to 12 o'clock on the 9th of April, was very quiet, Mm. not much going on. And we'd kind of been having a bit of a laugh and a joke, you know, behind the scenes. And then going up to the 12 o'clock news, li- literally minutes before, um, I I don't, was I was aware, unaware of this completely, but out in the newsroom, it had been, you know, we'd been told that he had died, sadly. Yeah. And I read the headlines and still didn't know, but everyone in the gallery, which is where they sit, you know, outputting the, it's where they, like the control room, if you like. Yeah. Um, I... They, they all knew. And then during the title sequence, the like 10 seconds of music off the back of the headlines, Chris Gray, who is a fantastic producer who was on shift that day, he said, Martin, we think the Duke's died. And I just went, don't joke about this. It's not funny. And he said, I'm going to send you the confirmation. So he sent me like an, an email on the, on my into my computer in the desk. And I just went, no. And I was told that I was to break the news off the back of a report about transport and COVID. And I just knew in that moment that I was going to have to change gear and that I got to get it right for everyone. I got to get it right for the BBC. I'd got to get it. If it's really, it might sound a bit pompous. And I don't mean it to, but I felt like I'd got to get it right for everyone in the country. Yeah. Got to get it right for the Queen. You know, this might sound a bit exaggerated, but I was very conscious of the fact that, you know, this had happened during COVID. Lots and lots of people had lost people they cared about because of coronavirus. And here was the Queen who, you know, her husband and consort of 73 years had died. Mm. And in a way, it's a great leveller, isn't it? Because whether you're the queen or whether you're just a sort of regular member of the public to lose somebody you care about is it's a common thing for us all yeah so i kept thinking about her and that that helps with tone because the most important thing for a presenter to get right is tone and pace don't rush think about what you're saying think about how you're saying it mean what you say and so i had for about four minutes that i had during which i interviewed down on the phone nicholas witchell our royal correspondent and we kept going for about four minutes until we reached the nine minutes past 12 mark at which point having taken off a necklace and put on a black jacket out of vision um we brought all of the english speaking tv channels together and i broke the news and we we went into the um, agreed program and once that was underway it, it kind i settled down i stopped yeah. feeling quite so panicky but i did feel very clearly that i got to get it right because this is going to become part of the archive and it was going to be played again and again yeah. and again and I, I couldn't afford to get it wrong now fortunately uh, I work with extremely professional, talented people. So although I'm the person that you see on the screen, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of other people behind the scenes, producers, ge- other journalists, editors, um, people who have production skills. So their sound vision, comms, direction, camera operators, floor managers, they're all 
all really good at their jobs too. So you all work together and hopefully you get it right. And that day we did. Yeah, absolutely. And I think Clive Myrie actually said this to you on Mastermind, but it's something that if you get it wrong, that's going to define your career, isn't it? Yeah, it's wrong forever. Mm. It's, yeah, and, and um, a lot of my colleagues said, I'm glad it was you. <laughs> I mean, they were all, they'll all be perfectly capable of doing it too. It's just, yeah. it's as you say, it could be career defining in a good way or a bad way. Yeah. So uh, you just, you just want to do every story justice, you know, mm. you just, it's often people's lives are deeply affected by the stuff we're reporting and, and you, you, you have to get it right for them. Yeah. And although in that moment when it first broke, you wanted to run away, do you still think it's perhaps a privilege that it was you that got to break such big news? Absolutely. I think my job is a privilege every single day mm. um, because you can make a difference to people's lives with the things that we do because you can give people information, hopefully, that's helpful to them. Um, um, but it's a total privilege. Yeah. And um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm very, I'm very glad it fell to me, and that I did a good job of it. Yeah. Now, would you want to do any other presenting outside of the news? Um. Yes, I would. But it's about the opportunities that come along. I mean, mm. so today I'm going to North Wales, and I'm going to be presenting from Brill in oh. North Wales. So it's news, but I'm out of the studio. So that's quite a nice thing to get to do. Um, I would quite like to make some documentaries about some things that I um, am interested in, but I haven't formulated those properly yet. Um, I wouldn't actually mind having a go to quiz show. Mm. Not mastermind because <laughs> yeah. I was doing that. But, you know, I don't know. Something something like that might be fun. Yeah. yeah. I'll watch it. If I got the chance. Yeah. Well, where are we able to keep up to date with you everywhere? Um, I'm on the BBC News Channel yeah. four times a week or on the BBC um, One O'Clock News or the Network News at the, on a Saturday night. Um, I'm on Twitter. So I try. I've got, I'm very fortunate to have a lot of followers, yeah. most of whom are extremely extremely nice people and I try to engage with as many people as I can it's getting more and more <laughs> difficult now because there are so many of them but I do try and you can have some really nice interactions with people um so that's that's where really I haven't joined Instagram or TikTok yet because my oh, yeah. children have told me I can't um because I'd be too embarrassing I think it's actual actually because I'd probably get more followers than that yeah probably <laughs> I don't know, but they don't want me to embarrass them because, you know, mums are really embarrassing, aren't they? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's so social media or the telly, really. Sometimes I host events as well that people can come to. So. Yeah. Well, many thanks for joining us here today. It's been great to talk to you. It's a pleasure, Toby. Thank you for inviting me.